operationally excellent companies, the highest form of recognition may be bestowed on the best team player. In product leadership organizations, it's individual feats that get celebrated. In customer intimate companies, the highest honor is likely to go to those employees whose clients rave about their contributions. The flip side of rewards, reprimands, are also parceled out with discrimination. Operationally excellent companies don't shy from penalizing team members when the team violates company-wide standards. Product leaders aren't reluctant to demote individuals whose performance is less than outstanding. To a great extent, the hero culture of some product leaders self-regulates people's behavior by treating below-average performance with indifference. At customer intimate companies, underperformers get a message when they are assigned to the least desirable client. A telling characteristic of market-leading companies is that their senior managers consistently display their own devotion to the customer credo. To tune into value, employees need only watch the boss in action. The story is told of Bernie Marcus, head of Home Depot, who walked into the back office of one of his stores and noticed a Sears craftsman wrench lying in a pile of items that customers had returned. Marcus called the store's customer service people together held up the wrench and asked who had accepted it as a return, since Home Depot doesn't sell Sears wrenches. One employee admitted guilt, whereupon Marcus broke into a grin. This was a great example, he said, of someone taking responsibility for doing the unorthodox to please a customer. Never forget, he told the people, to go the extra distance for the customer. Good management demands good role models. Most market leaders have their equivalents of Bernie Marcus, not just at the top, but throughout the organization. Thousands of managers sit in thousands of offices content with the idea that they can know all about their customers without much effort. They think they can spend a day or so every year touring their customers' plans, or that they can know all about consumers by chatting up a few of them at a checkout counter. Some think they can get a feel for customers by riding the company's delivery truck, reading through market research reports, digesting periodic customer surveys, or sitting in on an occasional focus group. Not so. That's not how upstart AT&T Universal Card Services rose to challenge the giant card issuers, nor how Southwest Airlines became the dominant carrier in the nation's busiest air travel markets. To their discredit, most managers are far too casual about inquiring into the minds and guts of their customers. Incidental and intermittent excursions are inadequate. They distort managers' views of customers with what social scientists call anecdotal evidence. If most of the customers they see on any particular occasion seem to be happy, they are inclined to conclude that most customers are happy, which isn't necessarily the case at all. Managers in companies that really succeed, in contrast, live with the customer. What's different with these companies is that they make a continuous, painstaking, and unrelenting effort to get everyone to walk in the customer's shoes, to experience what the customer experiences, to feel what the customer feels. Living with customer raises employees' sensitivity to their own products and services, not just at the time of purchase, but after the newness has worn off. Living with the customer is not a one-time or episodic event. It becomes a routine and substantial part of people's work schedules. They make it their business to know both their easy-to-please and their tough, demanding customers. In fact, they know that it's the latter who often challenge the organization the most and in doing so suggest new ways the company can improve its value. Living with the customer is a fact-laden experience. Ask the people at AT&T Universal Card which requires every manager in the company to listen in on two hours of customer service telephone calls each month. Or ask the managers at McDonald's. They go to great lengths, both at headquarters and in the field, to solicit customer feedback. They track and dissect the opinions and experiences of hundreds of thousands of customers every year, and they act on that information, incorporating it into every decision in their endless quest to improve the customer's eating experience. Living with a customer means going beyond the people in marketing, sales, or frontline customer service. Everybody in the organization, at workbenches and workstations, gets flooded with information and feedback on how their work affects what customers value.
one leading vehicle manufacturer uses a systematic approach called value management to codify different vehicle buyers' experiences. The codified information is used by the engineering staff to balance and rebalance design constraints, weight, cost, complexity, performance, aesthetics against customers' desires and expectations. It's still important, though, that employees remain focused. They don't want to live with just any customer, only with those to whom their company's value proposition is pitched. Even employees in a highly competent workforce can't find easy solutions to every problem. Customers may make demands that are unprecedented. Employees may see opportunities for better products or services that nobody has seen before. What to do? If the answer can't be found in a company's rule book, or if current practices appear too inappropriate to deal with the situation, what then? It's simple. You just ask people to use their heads. Give anybody, on the front line or in the lab, license to take on the role of customer advocate. Encourage and equip them to tackle issues affecting value creation reasonably and without a fuss. But be sure they understand that the customers for whom they are advocating should be the customers that fit the company's value discipline. The general prescriptions that market leaders follow in getting employees to act as customer advocates are straightforward. They build employees' competence. They open lines of communication between people in the organization whose cooperation is pivotal in enabling or expediting customers' wishes. They put information at people's fingertips. And they create fast feedback so employees find out quickly what works and what doesn't. They encourage employees to learn from their efforts. And of course, they provide employees with moral support, confidence, and encouragement in their efforts to move the value frontier forward. Customer advocacy is both a present and a future activity. Market leaders are clearly interested in filling the needs and expectations that customers have today. They are just as interested in responding to customers' dreams and wishes, that is, tomorrow's expectations about value. How companies respond to future expectations depends on the value discipline they are pursuing. Operationally excellent companies encourage change in their operating procedures rather than one-time acts of heroism. It makes little sense for them to get employees to pursue out-of-the-ordinary customer needs. Rather, these companies are interested in creating communication vehicles that will keep feeding them customer information, which they can turn into systematic improvements. Toyota, for example, encourages employees to submit ideas and suggestions. The company has been phenomenally successful in generating response. 20 million ideas in 40 years, or several dozen per person annually, and in getting the vast majority of them implemented. Toyota's secret? It established a procedure in which employees pre-screen their ideas. That is, they ask themselves whether they are focused on the credo of the company. Then it sends the screened ideas through a systematic procedure to mine for the ideas with merit. In product leadership companies, customer advocacy can involve championing new product concepts on the customer's behalf, lobbying to get a less than stellar new product improved or pulled from the lineup or working with customers to find out what would constitute a leap forward in product performance. At Silicon Graphics, product developers and designers work together with leading-edge customers to define and design superior products. At the leading sound equipment company, marketing managers join engineers on flights around the world to visit people in all the offices of a large multinational customer. They help all the customers' people not just its headquarters staff, in creating the spec for their new product. Customer intimate companies are by definition in the business of advocating the customer's interests. Employees in these companies are role models for customer advocates, since their daily work requires immersion in the customer's problems. For them, heroics on a customer's behalf are routine. The cult of the customer does indeed defy a succinct definition. But you'll know it when you see it, and you'll miss it when it's gone. The cult of the customer is more than an abstract concept. It's part of the way market leaders do their daily business. Chapter 12. Sustaining the Lead Pictured standing in a canoe on a 1986 cover of Fortune magazine was Kenneth Olson, founder and then president of Digital Equipment Corporation. 
he won the coveted cover spot for having piloted his corporate ship to record profits and growth. Yet just a few years later, Olson was toppled by his board of directors into the cold waters of forced retirement. Was Fortune's adoration the kiss of death? Olson was not the type of person to let publicity go to his head. His downfall, however, pumped new life into an enduring bit of management folk wisdom, that the moment an admired executive's face splashes across the covers of leading business magazines, the decline of the company he or she heads has begun. Over and over, companies slump within a few years of a rave review. It's happened to IBM, Westinghouse, American Express, and Kodak. The kiss of the media turns into a curse. Maybe there's no established cause and effect relationship between celebrity and decline, but the hangovers suffered by companies that drink the heady wine of fame are too common to ignore. That yesterday's stars so often turn into today's has-beens can't stem just from the evil eye of fate. We believe that praised and praiseworthy companies often fall into decline because they fail to maintain their well-conceived strategies. Having attained market leadership, many firms celebrate their victory, admire their own operating model, and exploit their advantages for shareholder gain. They simply rest on their laurels, and as they recline in the warmth of adoration, they fail to see they are violating a central rule of market leadership. Dominate your market by improving value year after year. Sustaining market leadership is a full-time job. Unless the energies of a company are fully mobilized to continuously create major improvements in value, it is impossible to retain a lead, especially when every competitor is hungrily working to knock off the leader and claim the top of the hill for itself. But staying focused and committed to customer value is hard. Success offers such tempting distractions and so many excuses for delaying improvement. Companies that expect to escape the fate that toppled the likes of digital must accept business as a copycat world. Little in business stays proprietary for long. Not products, processes, technologies, nor strategies. People emulate if they don't actually duplicate what wins. Almost all market leaders will find admirers and competitors copying their success. Continental Airlines is trying to replicate Southwest Air's operating model. Microsoft is roughly matching Apple Computer's easy-to-use operating systems. And Consolidated Freightway's Menlo Logistics Unit uses much the same approach to customer intimacy as roadway logistics systems. Copycats are on the prowl at all times in all industries. So how do market leaders of whatever value discipline stay ahead? They maintain the focus of their value discipline and intensively compete with their own success. They work continuously and simultaneously to improve their operating model and make it obsolete. They are operational excellence firms striving to reach entirely new benchmarks of price and hassle-free service. They are customer intimate firms trying to make their own total solutions obsolete. They are product leaders trying to destroy demand for their current products with dazzling new ones. Better they should do it than their competition. For every market leader, advances in value to customers are gained by tightening performance standards re-engineering work processes, and upgrading competencies. For operational excellent companies, the toughest challenge is to shift to the next generation of no-frills, standardized assets to achieve the next level of efficiency. For product leadership companies, the toughest challenge is to see the next technology, the next concept that is beyond the bounds of their expertise. For customer intimate companies, the toughest challenge is to let go of current solutions and to move themselves and their clients to the next paradigm. Let's look at each of these challenges in turn. Some companies stress the application of efficiency-enhancing assets to such an extent that they overinvest in the current paradigm. Prosperous firms can well afford the capital outlays, so they try to buy their way to efficiency by, say, acquiring newfangled machines. Line managers can often sell finance chiefs on projects that might otherwise get a thumbs down as offering too little benefit for the cost. American Express fell into this trap in the 1980s. Its $1 billion Genesis program was an ambitious effort to boost operating efficiencies through information technology. Reportedly, Amex collected large amounts of data on cardholders' buying patterns. It wanted to have the most advanced information technology. But the effort distracted Amex from more pressing concerns, in particular, the increasing price sensitivity of its merchant and consumer clients. This heavy investment in efficiency 
ultimately only added to Amex's cost structure. The threat? Assets that turn into liabilities. Market leaders can easily spend too much time figuring out how to better utilize assets that may no longer be the right ones. At American Airlines, the high-tech Sabre division made a science out of streamlining standard operating procedures, systemizing reservations, and filling planes. Yet Americans' core assets, namely planes, gates, and hub infrastructure, now block further improvements. Americans' major hubs at Dallas-Fort Worth and Chicago's O'Hare are high-cost facilities compared to Southwest facilities at smaller airports in the same cities, Love Field and Midway. Americans' airplanes span a wide variety of makes and models. That's the kind of variety that adds complexity and kills efficiency. And the Sabre system is itself a high-cost asset, absorbing large annual investments in maintenance. American Airlines had the right kind of assets for the established operating model in the domestic airline business, but they were not the right assets for the hyper-efficient operating model with which Southwest has challenged the industry. Restructuring of such big and flexible assets may be inevitable, if American wants to rival the efficiencies enjoyed by Southwest. Walmart may yet stumble as it encounters similar changes. It has done a yeoman's job of streamlining operations. It anticipated and mastered the operational skills for running warehouse stores. Together with Price Costco, it popularized and pushed to the limit the wholesale club. But a move by consumers toward home shopping, for instance, could turn a lot of Walmart's assets, stores, distribution centers, long haul trucks, inventory systems, into liabilities. Walmart's standard operating procedures could become irrelevant. Should a mass migration to home shopping materialize, consumers would redirect their orders to home shopping networks. Shipments could go out UPS or FedEx. Customer billing could be handled by credit card. Walmart managers gazing wistfully at empty parking lots would pine for the days of booming customer traffic. MCI telecommunications could face similar risks. Its main asset, its telephone network, enables the company to promise low prices on long-distance calls. But what happens when cable TV companies offer telephone service through their coaxial or fiber optic lines? What happens as telephone, computer, and TV technologies merge? MCI may need to make big moves to restructure its asset base to cushion risks and grab new opportunities. If MCI doesn't move, or move soon enough, Expect its star to dim by the prescience of companies like Microsoft, Time Warner, and Telecommunications, Inc., which are currently investing in this still unexplored future. Product leadership companies in particular become fascinated with great products. As a result, with each bright new idea or blunt complaint, the developers rush back to their labs in a perfectionist panic. An assessment of whether the perceived shortcomings are relevant or not is neglected in the rush. Getting too close to their customers can distort people's focus. For instance, high-tech companies frequently set up so-called user groups to critique products. When the engineers get their most enthusiastic and sophisticated users in a room to share experiences, a deluge of complaints and suggestions results. The engineers can hardly ignore the priority demands, but can they afford to accept them? At such times, product leaders must keep their goals in focus. Sustained product leadership comes only from a deep commitment to breakthrough innovations. Those ideas aren't usually gathered at user group meetings because users want to hone and polish the product they already have. Customer feedback is important. It helps to improve the value of existing products and to extend their life. But if investments and enhancements impede progress toward breakthroughs, then a serious mistake is made. Product leaders must make their own products obsolete. They must compete with their own success if they are to sustain their lead. Product leadership companies are prone to stumbling and fumbling when fundamental technologies and market conditions change radically. Experts, especially technical experts, are particularly prone to this human frailty. In 1895, a mere eight years before the Wright brothers' historic first flight, Lord Kelvin, president of Britain's Royal Society, the most prestigious scientific group in the world, declared that heavier-than-air flying machines were impossible. In 1920, Robert Millikan, a co-founder of quantum mechanics, declared that there was no likelihood that man would ever tap the power of the atom. In 1899, Charles Duell, head of the U.S. Patent Office, observed that everything that could be invented had been invented. Jack Warner, co-founder with his brother of Warner Brothers Studios, which produced the first talking picture, was skeptical of the new medium. 
Who the hell, he asked rhetorically, wants to hear actors talk? The threat? Sense that turns into nonsense. Not only assets soar or plunge in value as markets change, ideas come and go as well. Yesterday's truisms become tomorrow's falsehoods, and a company can easily develop blind spots that impair its people's skill at sensing the potential of new technologies and concepts. Remember General Motors in the 1970s and early 1980s. GM didn't understand or want to act on the changing tastes of young car buyers. When they wanted lighter, faster, nimbler cars with a European feel, GM's sense of that market segment resulted in nonsense. GM continued to believe that Chevy buyers would upgrade to bigger Buicks and ultimately to colossal Cadillacs. Old truths had changed, but GM hadn't changed its thinking. Who knows what will happen to cars next? The green movement has prompted Toyota to plan for environmentally sound, fully recyclable cars. Upcoming regulations governing fuel economy, material recycling, and employer-mandated carpooling to cut urban smog could shake up the car industry even more. Will we see an explosion of battery-driven vehicles or computer-guided transportation? Product leadership firms in the automobile industry don't know the answers to all these questions, but they must be exploring them so that they can stay ahead of the pack. Market changes put heavy pressure on product leader sensing skills. For the U.S. drug industry, for instance, markets have shifted toward generics. This shift puts to the test many of the procedures at companies such as Smith, Klein, Beecham, and Merck, which previously developed in merchandise products protected by their specific name value. A further challenge for drug makers is genetics research, which focuses on preventing disease, not curing it. For example, by the end of the decade, it's expected that researchers will discover genetic markers for the four kinds of cancer that account for most cancer deaths. These discoveries could make certain traditional drug therapy and treatment obsolete, turning what makes sense today into nonsense tomorrow. If companies aren't going to succumb to myopia as their markets change, they must invest in building the sensing skills that will help them know when a product is ripe for the market or when it is due for retirement. At the same time, however, product leaders must continue to speed innovation if they expect to sustain their lead. High-tech product leaders such as Microsoft invest heavily to accelerate invention, partly through close ties with fast-moving startup firms. Media companies such as MTV are striving to stay a step ahead of a society that is evolving at a dizzying pace. Some product leaders are re-engineering for speed. Pharmaceutical firms are reducing the time it takes to market their products by working with the Food and Drug Administration to redesign its drug approval process. Consumer product leaders are bringing concepts to market faster by simulating them with software or testing them in market labs called greenhouses. Customer intimate companies are particularly susceptible to the illusion that they can do absolutely anything to give customers the total solution promised. It leads them to take on tasks they should decline or should pass on to other suppliers. For instance, they may persist in providing services they once performed uniquely well, but which over time have been copied by so many competitors that they've become commonplace. When yesterday's premium services become today's basic standard, the customer intimate company has to find ways to offload them. The threat? Knowledge that turns into ignorance. All too often, the blast that knocks a high-flying company out of the sky comes not from a competitor with stronger sets of the same skills, but from one armed with skills that the high-flyer doesn't have. As the old saying goes, it's not what you know, but what you don't know that hurts you. One simple example. In the 1970s, IBM found that its dedicated customer base of information systems professionals had shifted roles. The technology mavens were no longer the main specifiers and buyers of IBM's products. IBM found itself ignorant of the needs of its new clientele, the financial executives and line managers who now signed the purchase orders. Like seasoned business people set down in a foreign land, IBM Salesforce knew the business, but not the new language they were expected to speak. Cot Corporation, to pick just one customer intimate market leader, has to worry about the future in lots of dimensions. Giving customers the soda formulation and packaging they want may not be enough to retain clients. Walmart may want COT to tie in with its sophisticated cross-docking procedures. Safeway may want it to tie in with leading-edge store-door deliveries. Does this mean that COT's network should include a world-class logistics provider? Should COT forge alliances with firms that conceive and build such capabilities? 
How knowledgeable does COD itself have to be to excel in brokering these co-provider services? Could its expertise in one area be threatened by its ignorance in others? Those are the kind of questions customer intimate companies have to think about continually in order to sustain their leads. COT's situation shows how customer intimate companies' delivery systems can make or break them. Whether COT delivers the total solution itself or draws on a network of co-providers, it nonetheless receives all the blame or credit. The other distinctive asset possessed by customer intimate firms is their consulting expertise. Customers depend on it, but since the value of such expertise diminishes as customers themselves become more expert, customer intimate companies must learn to stay two steps ahead of customers. They must assimilate experience from multiple clients, acquire fresh insights by hiring new people, and pick the brains of outside experts. To beat back rivals, they have to adapt their expertise to new clients and to the changes in existing clients' basic problems. Staying smart is their greatest challenge. Of course, even if market leaders stay ahead by constantly refining those capabilities that keep them on top, they can still fall behind if they don't periodically improve secondary disciplines. Minding these is most critical when competitors are resetting customers' expectations for performance. For instance, as Ford and Toyota elevated expectations about automobile quality, they blocked Hyundai from making significant market inroads, even though Hyundai products were bargain priced. Dell Computer and Gateway 2000 reinvented competition in the personal computer industry by focusing on price and convenience, which had been secondary disciplines for the big entrenched computer makers who then had to improve their own performance in these dimensions. One product leadership company hit hard by rising customer expectations in price and convenience was Apple Computer, which responded with improvements that enabled it to drop prices on some of its products by as much as 34% and meet the resulting surge in customer demand. Apple may still have some way to go to catch up with rapidly rising operational standards in the PC business, but it has at least shown that it's capable of a response. Digital Equipment Corporation, on the other hand, was caught flat-footed. Digital was an impressive market leader until the early 1990s, riding high on its reputation as product leader. But the company lost its product edge, and then it plunged into the red by underestimating its deficiencies in operational performance. At the end of 1990, the company had 50,000 more employees than it could afford, and even then it could barely match IBM's unimpressive productivity level as measured by sales per employee. Executives should be wary, however, of overzealous efforts to polish their company's secondary disciplines. Too much attention paid here can deflect attention from the more important tasks required to strengthen the company's value proposition. The goal is to sustain threshold levels of the other values, but not overinvest. In the early 1980s, McDonald's, for example, overreacted to competitive innovations by loading up its menu with too many new items – pizza, tacos, chicken fajitas. These items created confusion and complexity in the operation without undercutting the threats posed by specialized pizza parlors or Mexican food purveyors. The company had to retrofit kitchens to prepare the new foods. It had to train suppliers to handle different orders. Worse yet, its 18 million daily U.S. customers got confused about what McDonald's stood for. Whatever happened, customers wondered to the good old Big Mac. McDonald's quickly came to its senses and recommitted itself to keeping its eye on the ball it could hit best, operational excellence. General Motors also went astray in the early 1980s when, bent on bolstering its operational excellence, it poured money into plant modernization and innovation. Some new investment was essential, but then Chairman Roger Smith went overboard. He sought through billions of dollars of investment to build the factory of the future, to catapult the company way beyond the state-of-the-art in manufacturing technology. He aimed to substitute robotics for people in order to drive down manufacturing costs. Smith's overweening faith in technology and in his company's ability to harness it mired GM in challenges far beyond its capabilities. GM, in effect, took itself to the cleaners. Try as they might to retain operational focus, market leaders sometimes lose it. The leader's vision becomes blurry, not from gazing at a far horizon, but from staring at the ground before them too closely. What Polaroid valued most and did best was research, but instead of allocating energy and resources to exploiting the results of that research, it just continued to do more of it. 
it became myopic. More commonly, companies grow short-sighted because they're tempted by short-term rewards. They think that squeezing more money out of an existing business will, for instance, boost their stock prices. Wall Street will love us. Other companies believe their strong brand name will let them raise prices with impunity, or that if costs come down, they can bank them instead of passing them along to the client. Cereal makers like Kellogg, whose products now cost more than Casio's calculators, will steadily lose market share. Walmart, on the other hand, has resisted the temptation to inch its prices upward and has been rewarded by steady, impressive growth. Expansion that's too rapid is another form of corporate myopia. Toys R Us concentrated on global expansion at the expense of running its existing stores, which gave Walmart the opening it needed to grab an increasing share of what had been the Toys R Us market. Both Walmart and Toys R Us are classic operationally excellent retailers that emphasize low prices and hassle-free basic service. Walmart leveraged its $80 billion scale to take over as the price leader, though Toys R Us's prices are still comfortably lower than most other specialty retailers. Toys R Us offers the broadest selection in the industry, but Walmart has started to close the gap during the crucial Christmas selling season. It's no contest on location convenience. Walmart has four times as many locations coast to coast, and many consumers are in the habit of regularly shopping in these stores. As for in-store experience, Walmart has trained its staff to be friendly and helpful without giving up much efficiency. Toys R Us staff is poorly trained and often indifferent to customers' needs. What's been the result? Walmart has almost doubled its market share over the past four years to 16%. Toys R Us has grown only modestly to about 22%. Toys R Us needs to improve its value proposition if it's going to stay at the top. In the late 1980s, IBM gave out biased advice when it told clients that it could meet all their computing needs, even as the marketplace began to favor supplier-neutral open systems and the use of multiple vendors. Today, IBM is trying to heal the wounds it inflicted on its own reputation. IBM account reps now explore both IBM and non-IBM possibilities when advising customers how best to meet their specific needs. Market leaders place their leadership in jeopardy when they exploit value at the expense of innovation. Pepsi, for some reason, believes that dating its soda cans will generate more customer demand. And Coke believes that reintroducing in plastic the corset-shaped bottle that helped make it famous will rejuvenate the brand. Meanwhile, Snapple and other aspiring leaders are making sharp inroads in the soft drink market. Their secret? They're doing real product innovation, instead of just tinkering with their package design. Compare their effort with that of pharmaceutical maker Glaxo, which has invested in 200 outside research programs that could potentially feed new drugs into its pipeline. The greatest temptations facing market leaders? Getting greedy, milking their success, and not moving forward. Operationally excellent companies can get tempted into overpricing, product leaders into under-innovating, and customer intimate firms into under-servicing. Balance is essential in all three value disciplines for sustained market success. It leads to win-win outcomes that generate payoff for everyone. Customers, employees, and shareholders. Imbalance, unless corrected, pitches companies into a death spiral. Increasingly less profit forces them into further value exploitation, which accelerates the downward plunge. Each one of the three value disciplines has its own strategy from which a company diverges at its peril. That's not to say that tactics can't change. A successful company is infinitely flexible in acting to sustain its lead. But myopia, temptation, the loss of balance, and other such perils can mortally wound the strategy that sustains leadership. Epilogue It's conceivable, even plausible, given current trends and patterns, that business historians in the year 2001 will look back at the last decade of this century as an era of profound change, perhaps even a historic turning point. During that fateful decade, historians may conclude, a new breed of market leaders emerged. These leaders weren't simply the younger, more vigorous offspring of the old breed. They didn't just work harder to meet tougher customer demands. Instead, they broke the mold and build a new one by basing their success on one of the disciplines chronicled in this book. They chose their customers deliberately, walking away from those that didn't fit their visionary new molds. They chose to narrow, not broaden, their operational focus, 
all thanks to all customers, suddenly seemed as outdated as a manual typewriter. And by committing themselves to deliver more value year after year after year, they were able to sustain their lead and dominate their markets. To turn their determination into deeds, they upgraded, renovated, and built new operating models capable of delivering unprecedented levels of customer value, which in turn raised customer expectations. Skyrocketing expectations raised everyone's thresholds. The new leaders had redefined the concept of competition. During the 1990s, our business historians saw operating models evolve at a dizzying pace, first at the hands of the pioneers discussed in this book. They were soon followed by a wave of struggling companies bent on emulating the new leader's success. Then came the newcomers, the startups, the entrepreneurs eager to capitalize on the innovative new operating models. As established companies narrowed their focus and learned to master the discipline of market leaders, they became aware of the constraints of their existing traditional business structures. This awareness led the large and integrated corporations to restructure themselves into separate units that each excelled in a single discipline. Shared resources were kept to a minimum. Companies also turned to other companies for help in designing and running those parts of their operating model that were necessary but not critical to value creation. This in turn led to a surge in demand for new corporate connections in the form of outsourcing, joint ventures and strategic alliances. The business historians will look back at the 1990s as an era in which the workforce was re-energized. The new insights gained about value creation spurred innovation in products, services, and customer relationships. They provided much needed relief from the energy zapping and demoralizing downsizing that had characterized corporate behavior in the early years of the decade. The mid and late 1990s were a period of optimism and renewed purpose for companies and their employees. The business historians will marvel that a simple idea better value for customers year after year had such profound ramifications and customers they just loved it and kept expecting more and more this is michael tracy we hope you enjoyed this presentation of the discipline of market leaders this program was produced by lon bender and wiley Stateman, and directed by janice weber of sound deluxe audio publishing the Discipline of Market Leaders is a production of Sound Deluxe Audio Publishing, Incorporated. Copyright 1995. All rights reserved. Copies of The Discipline of Market Leaders are available wherever books are sold. For corporate purchases and discounts, call the Minds Eye Audio at 1-800-227-2020. What follows is an interview with the authors, conducted in March 1995. If you look at the companies we have identified clearly as market leaders, they obviously are not only adopting partial aspects, facets of the discipline, they are clearly following all of the tenets. They are really clearly embodying the whole notion of being focused on uh, choosing your customers and dominating your market as a result. The companies that really lead to far, far more questions are the ones who are not in the lead. I would say maybe only one out of ten companies in any industry are real clear leaders, nine out of ten are not, and those people are in fact following partial aspects of the disciplines but the problem is that what they're doing is they are following partial aspects of two or three different disciplines and as a result become incredibly confused so it's not that they're not doing things right it's just that they're trying to do too many things right or let me say it differently they but they believe that more is better the more good ideas you apply the better off you are they believe that bigger is better, and bigger doesn't always mean better, because if bigger means that you are going to be, be moving into three, four different directions, then obviously being bigger can really become a stumbling block. These companies believe that being more customer responsive is better. It's in a Again, uh, is, is leading them into trouble because being more customer responsive can lead them into doing two or three different things rather than focusing on one. So it is not so much that they don't follow, don't follow at least partially some of the disciplines we outline. The biggest problem they're running into, the biggest thing they're missing out on is that they're not focused on one and dedicate themselves to really excelling in that one discipline they have chosen.
Information technology and information systems are clearly having a big effect on overall structure. There's no question about it. The primary effect they're having is that they're really lowering the cost of coordination and making it a lot easier to link together a network of companies that cooperate to deliver a particular value out to a customer. You no longer need to use a hierarchy to create coordination. You can now use networks of, of computers and communications devices to achieve the same result. That's resulting in a movement away from vertical integration and toward virtual integration instead. Uh, of course, the most dramatic impact of technology is seen in operational excellence firms because in these firms, where they are standardized and highly centralized, it's easiest to invest in information systems. These are also the firms that focus on the end-to-end -end product delivery process. They focus on the customer service cycle. Both those processes highly structured are processes that are easy to automate. So if you want to see the most advanced uses of technology in the world today, you have to go to the Hertz's, you have to go to Walmart, you have to go to, to companies like that, Federal Express, that are really focused around operational excellence and have created an environment in which information technology can really have a very major impact. If you look at the main themes we are seeing amongst these market-leading companies, it is very evident to me that we are seeing a trend that leads companies to be more and more focused. You might call it disintegration of large companies, breaking them up into separate business units, each focusing on the areas they can really truly excel in, which means that by implication they will have to draw on other companies to do the rest of the work. So they might have to form alliances with other companies, partnerships, joint ventures. They might have to go and do outsourcing of some of their business to other companies to get the rest of the work done while they concentrate on the part of the business they truly and, and absolutely are excelling in and continue to excel in. So from an operational aspect, Focusing means disintegration, and that will definitely lead to far more more companies being being set up. It will lead to far more new relationships being built, and it will lead to, I think, a lot of opportunities for large as well as small companies to become co-providers or to become providers to one another in order to deliver on this value that is being promised to the customer. Now, that is from an operational aspect what is the major influence we see in the next millennium. Uh, there is another aspect that comes out of this work that has far more to do with cultural cultural implications of what we're talking about. Uh, we realize that in order to be really, really unsurpassed in delivering value, you have to add some very, very major, major attention to how you deal with the people in your organization, how you treat them, how you build what we call the cult of the customer in your organization. And that cult of the customer, that company culture is going to become an increasingly important aspect of what makes everybody work together properly and keep them focused on the one thing that really makes them stand out. Building that corporate culture means adding some clarity, some direction, some very, very major meaning to individuals for their work. And it gives them the kind of satisfaction to work for a company where they are actually going to be incredibly proud to come to the company every day, to wake up in the morning and say, hey, I know what I'm going to do. I am, I am very clear about what my role is in delivering value. I know how I work with my co-workers to get this done. And I, in general, live, live really the culture that my company embodies, all of which is aimed at providing the best value in the marketplace. And I think those two, two major influences, both the operational influence and the cultural influence, will, I think, very clearly be a trend that we'll see for a long, long time. In the case of the discipline of market leaders, Fred and I have been conducting this research for nearly seven years now, and we've been speaking about this topic for a couple of years, which has helped us to really tune our language and communicate better some of the basic ideas that are contained within it. Uh, there may be a book in our future. Um, I like the discipline of market leaders, but it's out there some ways uh, in our future. We are obviously constantly intrigued by what is happening in this business world, what are new questions are that are emerging, and we certainly see, uh, in many cases, we see some very clear, different uh, perspectives emerge that, uh, that can be developed into, into an article or a book. Uh, the key thing is actually finding the, uh, finding the time and the energy to do that. So it comes down to when will we get the spark to go on to the next book, but I definitely think it's a possibility. Mm -hmm.